We are gathered here today to honour the death of comedy. Originally born in Greece, around 335 BC, not many people were around, so not many people were laughing. Comedy lived a long life, unfortunately until its death, which was last year, on October 2nd, 2017. Comedy was leaving the Sydney Opera House, October 2nd, 2017, and was shot in the back of the head, decapitated, uh, and its body, random and wet, turned up on the doorstep of a straight white male. Comedy had lived a long and luxurious life, and it rubbed shoulders with many wonderful smart and famous people. The likes of Shakespeare, Tom LaHare, Marcel Duchamp, Richard Pryor, Gilda Radner, George Clooney, George Carlin, Gene Wilder, Kathy Griffin, Gina Riley, Jane Turner, Margaret Cho, Magda Shabansky, Stuart Lee, Tim Minchin, Tim Robinson, Tim Allen, Tim Hawkins, Timothy Clark, Tim Meadows, Tim Heidecker, Tim Vi- God, there's a lot. There's, fuck, there's a lot of Tims here. And many others named not Tim. Comedy leaves behind a legacy, for it is an enigma. Constantly changing, constantly evolving. In that way, we may never truly know comedy. Because it is always going to change. While constantly changing through the centuries, through the works of these people, comedy is redefined and retold. And of course, rediscovered by many people. Comedy has not always been guilty, nor has it always been innocent. Not always a victim, but not always an assailant. Many have used and abused comedy for its many riches, even if it has left many of them poor. Because the fall from hubris is in itself very funny. Both in wealth and in spirit, a laugh can be had from any person, regardless of race, creed, sexuality, gender, or upbringing. As long as they remember that they have to be responsible that laughter. And that humour, it wields a strength. It wields a power. For life is a joke, and to be the butt of any joke is truly human. For I would know, as I am one of them, I am a butt. A big, big, smelly butt. And with the death of comedy, I say long live comedy. For one day, which may truly live within the soul, all of us, big, smelly butts. Thank you very much. Hey, how now? 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 Yeah, big shit poppin'. To start off this video, I'm a 20-something straight white male who works in a major city. I'll have a goddamn good steak and take public transport to work every single day. My parents were lower to middle class with my mother working in tech and in education while my father was a small business owner for several years being a chef on and off. My background, to say the least, is fairly common for comedy. I've been a failed stand-up comedian for about the last four years, and trust me, I know what's not funny. Most often or not, I have heard from several different people about the death of comedy or the death of free speech. And I have to say, it's not true at all. I've constantly heard that this uh, idea comes from three weird talking points or arguments. First, that comedy isn't what it used to be, saying from how long ago, I'm not quite too sure. The second, that you can't say anything anymore, which is often used by comedians and free speech activists. Finally, that certain people are considered mainstream comedy now. I will attempt to break all three of these down the best way possible, but I wanted to make sure that this isn't a direct attack on a group of people or particular people in the comedy scene. This is more just a general issue that I feel comes up more often than not, and it makes me feel constantly uncomfortable that it keeps spreading and keeps getting weirder and weirder and bigger and bigger. So with that being said, let's start at the top. Comedy isn't what it used to be. This one is a little bit odd. Yeah, comedy evolves and changes. In fact, the definition of what comedy is is very different from when it was just around in 335 BC. It's changed from the Middle Ages, it's changed from the beginning of the century, it's changed from the beginning of this millennia. It is always constantly changing, and to keep it around in the same way 
is a really weird way to think about culture in general. Think about how 10 years ago we didn't really even have the MCU and now it's the biggest franchise in all of history. It's bigger than Bond, it's bigger than Harry Potter, it's bigger than all of the Fast and Furious films combined and those started in 2001. So yeah, comedy has changed because more people keep getting added to it and more ideas keep getting added to it. If you wanted to look to say 20 or 30 years ago, I highly suggest looking at say for example, Everything is Terrible's Comic Relief Zero. I've highly suggested that comedians and friends of mine watch this because it is a testament to looking at comedy from a different lens. It's not just because a lot of the material may be considered offensive, but it shows that a lot of repetition comes through comedy. A lot of people will be using the exact same jokes, premises, and punchlines, and then that's the main thing you want to avoid as a comedian. We do something now that all comedians do. Talk about the Japanese. It's not hello. What do these people got against the letter fucking L? <laughs> hello. Hello. How do you do? Hello. You can't make a business deal with them because you can't look them in the eye. Koreans from Seoul. Korea. Orientals. I used to call them Chinamen. Yeah, I saw this Oriental couple in the airport. A race of very short people. From here down. Pee pee the size of an egg roll. Two and a half inches. Three inches. Three inches. Three inches. Three inches. Three inches. They take pictures. Are English? Another new one. Another new one. You got to You take up shoes. Ah, yeah, that's it. Bye-bye. Number 10. Would you like us a combat ticket? You need two shirts. Ah, why don't I walk out there? Ah, you don't need a mom. So sue me. Ching chong chong. Oh, ping hao. I want an enum. One enum. King Bang, King Ding 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 Dong Bong Boga Dong Dong Bong Ding Dong Boing Ding Dong Bong Bing Dong Boing Bing Bing Ling Chow Stong Chow Ah Wow What are you doing? Oh, stinking Japanese! You don't want to hit them because you think they know karate. It's time for Kung Fu Master. It's called Samurai Warrior. Ah! My luck, I get the only guy from Japan doesn't know karate. Mm. Oh, 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 Corora. Toyota. Suzuki. Toyota. Toshiba. Why you not know joke when you hear joke? The Japanese don't know how to have fun. Have you seen them on vacation? Like I was saying, some people may find it offensive and cringy, and to be honest, it is subjectively. But comedy is different because comedy changes over time. It's not just because a lot of the material in there would be considered offensive nowadays, but the fact that it's, it looks like once comedy was corporatized and turned into a business venture, it became very stale very quick. It happened in the late 80s and early 90s where more comedy clubs were popping up everywhere and people were trying to get a piece of that pie. And it kind of brought out the worst in people and eventually burst in the early 90s. Some people stayed on and obviously they've had incredible, amazing, illustrious careers, but there was always some comedians who were, let's just say it, not doing a good job. And I'm seeing the exact same thing happen now, but from a digital standpoint. It happened in the 80s and 90s because VHS players and videotapes were easily accessible and comedy specials were very cheap to produce. And obviously with the invention of a stronger digital economy, especially here in Australia, we're seeing a lot of people produce and create different types of comedy, whether it's sketch or even just new stand-up specials. But this obviously brings in an issue that wasn't really solved in the 80s and 90s, and that's around quality control. If you have enough money, you can create your own comedy special. You can have producers and directors and a whole bunch of cool rigs that, that basically zoom around the entire arena to make sure you get the good shots of yourself. But it doesn't stop you from doing and saying what you want. It mainly feels like these people are protecting free speech that is more akin to hate speech rather than actual comedy. It's to put people down. It's to put them in their place rather than actually going against the status quo, which has been a part of comedic history. Yes, it's being subversive, but to what end? Who is this actually for other than people who agree with them? Isn't that their argument against shows like Saturday Night Live or that they're just agreeing with other people? A much better argument is that rather than agreeing with one another, is that their punchlines are stale or that they're saying the same things over and over again. Yes, that gets tiring and yes, that's exactly what kills comedy. Not the reasons they're actually saying. For example, on shows like Saturday Night Live or even Last Week Tonight, some of the punchlines are definitely similar, but at least they're told in different ways and from different perspectives and by different people. Anyway, it's a lot to think about. It's mainly that there are more voices and that those voices are new and different and weird and are from people who usually don't do comedy. Rather than actually giving them a shot or actually getting them to pertain to their own audiences, they're trying to snuff them out. Mainly under the guise of, they're not that funny or they're not my kind of funny. And that's totally fine, but also it's completely false. Most of these comedians have an audience, it's just that they're not the regular audience that would usually come to comedy. Actually, comedy in itself is a lot more splintered now. 
And that's okay, because that's very true. In fact, all entertainment is extremely splintered now. It's why we have multiple streaming services while we try to pull away from cable. It's why there's multiple different types of ways that you can play video games, despite the fact that a lot of people are just still playing stuff on consoles. The variety and the way that these different technologies evolve affect entertainment and the way that it is associated with the creators as well as the audience. These things happen. It happened in the 80s, it happened in the 90s, and it's happening again now. And again, it's not like comedy has remained consistent from that period of time. It also has changed. It shows that comedy specials need to evolve with the medium. For example, if you look at what I believe is a precursor to the show in the net, Bo Burnham's Make Happy. That show in itself is a wonderful testament to Bo's incredible inventiveness as a director, writer, and performer. But I didn't hear anybody talking about how controversial or wrong or weird or different or unfunny because Burnham had been around a long time and had been an established name. It's kind of weird because both shows, Nanette and Make Happy, both released on Netflix and both had a very positive response on release, break down the stereotypes of being a comedian and performer and uses the medium of both stage and screen to their advantage. It deconstructs tropes and problems and wider issues around comedy, and also takes a look at why, to their belief, mainstream comedy has become this way. It's very, very difficult to see a point of view that isn't obviously my own when it comes to comedy, because I have my own experiences of being a performer and comedian. But I'm also somewhat self-aware, much like Burnham and Gatsby are, that the intention for them, which they've both often stated, is about what makes them laugh and then finding an audience that can laugh with them and not necessarily at them and what they do on stage. And that's kind of the role of a comedian. In fact, one of the first things I was ever told as a comedian is to get the audience on your side, and more often than not, the best way to do that is to talk about yourself. It's why comedians can be kind of considered narcissistic, but it's one thing that, that I was taught earlier on. The difference is, is that obviously Burnham was established for a, a variety of different reasons, while Gadsby was considered new to the form even though she'd been performing for over a decade. In fact, one of the earliest Royal Comedy Specials I ever saw was the one that she actually won. She was hilarious then, she's hilarious now, and I think her humility, and obviously the way that she is able to express her jokes through dry humor, has resonated with a particular audience. The problem is, is that when she was pushed to an international stage, and when then so many people were writing and talking about her special, that was not her intention. Her intention was just to make a show that was to make people laugh and to tell her story. It was from her perspective. She was talking about herself. She was reinforcing the first rule that even I was told as a young comedian trying to learn the ropes. Both Gatsby and Bo have gone from strength to strength to the point where they are both creating fascinating, emotional, and amazing responses that have to do with comedy. And I do think that that's important. Whether Burnham continues to be a director or, or wants to do stand-up again, it's completely up to him, but both him and Gadsby have made a point about how both mediums can be very, very limiting and can be very, very destructive to a comedian's mindset and psyche. So yes, while comedy is different, it's always been different. And I think the main thing about comedy is that it's always meant to be railing against the status quo. I don't know if you've looked around recently, but a lot of people who would be considered very right-wing, or at least center, are in power especially in the United States, United Kingdom, and in Australia. So if you wanted to focus on a macro level, I would say that people who are constantly making jokes or who are left-wing affiliated being a part of comedy, I would say that that voice is necessary. Even controversial figures who I find extremely problematic but love to death, like Dan Harmon, have made an incredibly important point about the way that offensive material has changed over time. Jerry Seinfeld says that political correctness will destroy comedy. You agree? Mm, no. I think that political, I, th I think that what destroys comedy always is um, lack of sincerity. I, I, I think people trying too hard to do anything other than make themselves laugh. I think that we have classically tolerated things that push our boundaries and push our buttons. And, and when we let people get away with it, it's particularly because there's a sense that that artist is, is being sincere. And I think that the trouble is when it's when an unfunny comic who's trying to be funny by being controversial does a joke about a topic that, that, that raises um, eyebrows. That's when we really get fallout. It's not when someone's being hilarious. Um, it's, it, the, the fact is 85% of all anything is bad, including comedy. So 85% of <laughs> comics are out there doing bad jokes. And so, yeah, the political correctness maybe is 
is good to like go in go into that ditch and go look if you're gonna run the poop through the sewer here next to Rome like we need some health uh, <laughs> regulations. The status quo of comedy should never, ever be the exact same of those in power. I think that comedy should always be risking and should always be challenging. And while some people might not find it funny now, they probably will in five to 10 years. You look at comedians like George Carlin or Bill Hicks who eventually found their audience sadly after their death or in their late stages of life. And it's terrible to see because some may view it as wasted talent, but you could even see in this clip like George Carlin would be talking about something very specific that is happening right now. Think of Andrew Dice Clay. No one can talk to a comedian today and not yeah. ask an opinion you about can't, it. You can't do an interview without it. I, I would defend to the death his right to do everything he does. The thing that I, that I find unusual, and it's, you know, it's not a criticism so much, but his targets are underdogs. And comedy traditionally has picked on people in power, people who abuse their power. Uh, women and gays and immigrants are kind of, to my way of thinking, underdogs. And, um, you know, he ought to be careful because he's Jewish. And a lot of the people who want to pick on these kind of groups, the Jews are on that list a little further. You got women, gays, gypsies, blah, 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 blah. And suddenly you find Jews. And, and Andrew, suddenly Andrew's arrested. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I, I mean, obviously he should do what he wants. And uh, Why does he get away with it, do you think, then? Well, because we have never laughed at jokes about the Well, poor. he's appealing. I think he's appealing largely. I think his core audience are young white males who are threatened by these groups. I think a lot of these guys aren't sure of their manhood because that's a problem when you're going in through adolescence. You know, am I really? Am I, could I be? I hope I'm not one of them. And the women who assert themselves and are competent are a threat to these men. And so are immigrants in terms of jobs and, and, uh, and, and the So that's why we as an audience then will laugh. I, you say we, I don't think you're I mean, either, I don't know. But I, I mean think the you're, collective that, we. I think that's what, what is at the core of that experience that takes place in these arenas is a certain, uh, a, you know, a, a sharing of, of uh, anger and rage at, 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 these, at these targets. These kind of voices were railing against the status quo. These kind of voices were, dare I say, political. And no one complained about it back then. In fact, a lot of people were complaining about the fact that it violated obscenity rules. In fact, more often than not, that's why people have looked towards offensive comedians, because they were offensive at the time. If you continue to kind of push what is considered the status quo, you are kind of a status quo warrior. You're less of a jester for the people and more of a court jester, just making jokes for the king, because the king agrees with you. And I don't know if you like it or not, but I would never really want to agree with a king who's kind of cool with hating on people all the time, especially those who would be considered minorities or make up less than 0.01% of the comedy community, let alone of Australia's own population. In fact, if you wanted to look even closer in Australia at the Melbourne International Comedy Festival, the winner for this year was a straight white male. James Caster's amazing show, Cold Lasagna 1999, was incredibly funny and resonated with both the audiences that he brought in as well as the critics. It was a very, very much beloved show, and you can even look at a greater level for someone like John Mulaney, a straight white male who originally started doing comedy in Chicago, rose up, started working on SNL, and now has multiple Netflix specials and is beloved by many comedians. And then on top of that, if you wanted to look at who you consider to be offensive comedians who never apologize for their material, they have. Multiple times. In fact, multiple times over the last four years. Even people like Joe Rogan, or even, dare I say it, Louis C.K. I know that man has fallen from grace, but he even had the self-awareness to apologize to certain people about jokes that he was doing about them. It's a weird experience when you see these people who are constantly railing against the death of comedy, as it were, but really have no leg to stand on, either theoretically or figuratively. It's just that there are more voices. Yes, it's splintered, and yes, it doesn't necessarily take away from your audience, but also, why are you so mad about this? Is it because your material isn't that good? Even if your material isn't that good, you can still cultivate an audience. For example, say if you had a million followers and half of those followers were in Australia, 500,000 people isn't something to sniff at. In fact, 500,000 people is about as big as the town that I came from, Wollongong. It's bigger than most kind of cities like that, like, say, Geelong, Ballarat, Bendigo, or even fucking Newcastle. That's a big audience. In fact, if you were doing shows and you were selling out those shows during a comedy festival, why are you so mad? Why are you so upset? I get that the Melbourne International Comedy Festival is a close-knit group of people who, yes, decide who wins or loses certain awards, but they don't necessarily decide who is the funniest and who isn't the funniest. Audiences do that. 
In fact, I would be more afraid about being less inclusive in your audience because I've found that audiences over time tend to dwindle, both on and offline, because there's always new people to see and new things to say. But if you're saying the same things over and over again, I would say that that's an issue. And that isn't an issue about free speech. That's just an issue about not having good enough material. If I just flip flop 